Welcome, dude. Of course. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This is awesome. Well, it's I your haven't... best work yet. It, it, it had to get you on here. It's hilarious. Oh, I appreciate that very much. <laughs> Good God. Um, I appreciate Shrine of that the, very much. Shrine of the Orange Sun is about to get dropped on an unsuspecting public. When does this, when does this monster come out? It's coming out Friday, July the 14th of Year of Our Lord, 2023. I should probably get this edited and posted before then. I've been oh, a little challenged. don't worry about it, my friend. I've been, I've been a little challenged lately. Um, two separate physical issues that make it really hard for me to sit at the same time. Well, look, I, what I always say is health first, riffs second. Right? What I blame it for, on... That goes for mental health, too. <laughs> we're we're going to do an investigation on this. I think it's from um, four years of carrying a solid nickel sousaphone on my shoulder in my Like school. this one back here. Yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Those things ain't light. <laughs> I, I think our bell no, is that's, a little... No, that, that's one of three that we have in the basement <laughs> in our music space down here. Oh, good God. That's a gorgeous. You should have got yourself a. You should have got yourself a fiberglass one. I could extend. I'll send you our fiberglass one. Well, back in the high school, you okay. To take up sousaphone. There's fiberglass, and then there are real sousaphone players. We we rolled with the big boys, babe. Fremont okay. Ross, marching little giants, class of '81. <laughs> and this is in. Are you lifer uh, Tar Heel? Oh God, no, no. Have I'm from been... Ohio. I, I'm stuck okay. here by circumstance. Ah, uh, okay. But um, it's kind of nice here. It's, we have three months out of the year that it's unlivable, and this happens again. <laughs> so I'm grateful yeah. that we're doing this a little early because in two more hours, no matter how much AC I have, it's going to be 80 gonna degrees get swampy. in here. Yeah. yeah. I have a lot of friends in North Carolina in the Ra Raleigh-Durham area. Well, that means you are due here for a tour at the Poor House or the local <clears throat> 506? That would be lovely. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> uh, you, you've heard all the stories of how prohibitively expensive it is for bands that have millions of dollars to be on tour right now. Yeah, uh, I know, but... You know, I don't quite have millions of dollars. <laughs> come on, man, you're a small you band. Know. You're used to paying to play. That's true. Um, That's true. We're not, we don't have to pay for a crew or anything like that. So True, true. It, it's all gratis. Yeah. Um, I'm thrilled to have you on, man. I, I remember I did, I think it was my very first reaction video. Was to it is our band. very first reaction video, too. So thank you for that. So I, how's appreciate things... appreciate it very, very much. Things are challenging out there for any band of any genre. And you have decided to kind of invent your own niche. So could you tell uh, us a little? No, I, I say invent. I, of course, am perfectly aware that, you know, there have been brass and woodwind instruments in heavy music since the very beginning. Uh, 1969, before Black Sabbath, okay? 21st century schizoid man. What do we have in there? A big old honking saxophone. And that song is super heavy for its time. It's super heavy for today. So I, I, yeah, I love that song. We're huge King Crimson marks in this band. I was kind of noticing that. I don't think I've ever heard the Mel Collins come out in y'all the way it does on Shrine of the Orange Sun. It is no. just this absolute nasty, but we'll, we'll get there. I, I've been out of the music loop for a very long time on the heavy end of things. I've been in the brass band world for the better part of 16 years. So um, like I'm, I'm slowly getting back into the swing of things. Very Conducting slowly. at the high school or college level? What have you been doing? No, none of that. I am part of the Honk Fest community. No. What is Honk? Honk is a... It's a global community of street brass bands, literally from all over the world. So the Honk Festival started in Somerville, Massachusetts, right next door to the town where we currently live right now in Medford, um, as a, a, a way for activist street bands from around the country to gather in one place and put on a show in the street, take over public spaces and play for good causes, play for the community. Uh, that started in 2006, and there are now Honk Fests 
quite literally all over the world in both hemispheres. Um, there's one in Texas. This is Honk, Texas in Austin. There's one in Seattle, New York, Providence. There's, I think, five in Brazil now. There's been one in London. There are uh, several in Canada. There's, there's dozens of them everywhere. And these are brass bands, bands that play in the street, playing for each other, playing for the community. Not your typical like high school marching band type stuff, but brass, you know, folk level street brass traditions like New Orleans funk, street brass, second line, Balkan brass. I actually have a Balkan brass band coming here in this very space that I'm uh, recording in right now later today to practice. I might jump on the top and, and uh, play some Balkan brass with them. I have a brass man from Chicago staying in my house right now <laughs> upstairs. They're on tour. They're called Rum Velvet. Check them out. They okay. play a lot of like uh, old, old time jazz and Raymond Scott tunes and all kinds of fun stuff. So I am very much still in that world because I'm surrounded by it, literally surrounded by it. <laughs> yeah, no But uh, that's how I got into brass music and learned how to write for horns. And uh, I will never, I will always have a foot in that world. And yeah, Eight Foot Manchild is kind of my attempt to synthesize my love of brass music and heavy music. It's All working really well. Music. What what sparked your interest in having those two worlds intersect? I just had an inkling that it could be done because uh, one of the bands I was in for many years and still consider myself a sort of satellite member is Emperor Norton's Stationary Marching Band from Somerville. And in the, over the years that I had been involved with that band, I would occasionally, when the opportunity presented itself, sneak in a little taste of thrash, sneak in a little taste of doom, sneak in a little taste of prog metal into the various tunes that I would write, into the tunes that I would arrange. We would play uh, Halloween shows every year because we're the, it's a circus band. Uh, they, you know, they, they play as part of the Boston Circus Guild for a lot of their gigs. So we would do a Halloween themed show every year. And that usually op uh, presented opportunities to throw in a little bit of metal because we're doing some spooky music, right? Mm -hmm. So we would do a cover. You know, I wrote uh, an arrangement of uh, Electric Funeral, Black Sabbath, for a brass band and electric guitar. And just the way everything kind of meshed together, uh, every time we would do something like that, I, I kind of got the idea, you know, I, I, I bet I could, I, I'm curious what the, the ceiling on this sort of thing is. I like just how far felt can I take it? A collective. I'm I'm reaching into the future, and and people that are listening to this, their ears just perked up. Went, hmm. Is, is there a recording <laughs> of the um brass, that version of Electric Funeral? There is not. If you want to hear an arrangement, uh, another arrangement that I did that is a mashup of, um, Dunwich, by Electric Wizard, and. <laughs> Uh, River Bottom Nightmare Band from Emmett Otter's Jug Band Christmas, the old uh, Muppet special. Okay. I matched those two tunes together and did a brass metal arrangement of those. And you can find those on the Emperor Norton Stationary Marching Band Bandcamp page. And all that money uh, goes toward a good cause if you wanted to download it. Obviously, I will be putting links down below. I do expect every single self-respecting stoner doomer out there to to hit that thing and support it give it a listen we recorded it during the pandemic it, we did it super super uh grimy like people were literally like recording their parts onto phones and then i did my best to to mix everything together so it's a kind a little bit lo-fi but the arrangement i think is what i'm most proud of if I you want to hear some brass yeah if you want to hear some brass and metal mixed together give it a listen this is fantastic. So that kind of helped morph into Eight Foot Man Child. Yes. And there's kind of two, two parallel Eight Foot Man Child paths, though. It's kind of a long story, and I don't know how bored you want to get. I want but... to get bored. See, <laughs> so, so this channel so exists there's... To, for up and coming bands and talk about the process. Right. So, besides, they put well, up with me. So... Boring's not an issue. <laughs> No, 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 no. Uh, so there has been a band in existence with the name Eight Foot Manchild since 2005. 
off and on with very long stretches of no activity in between bursts of activity. Let's put it that way. I just bumped the mic, sorry. Um, so 2005, I was uh, in college at... And I really, really wanted to... I, I, I and a, a small group of friends were kind of getting fed up with the way that they taught music there, and uh, especially jazz. And we just we just had a conversation one day. It's like, what's the most anti thing that we could make? So um, we came up with the idea of a a free improv noise trio, where we would get a bunch of toy instruments and synthesizers and theremins and things, and just throw them on stage with us. And let's just improvise the weirdest soundscapey type bull crap that we can come up with. Can I curse? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yes. So that was the idea behind that. Was uh, It's basically a musical troll job. It was like, let's, let's make the weirdest shit we possibly can and try to weird people out intentionally. And we came up with the name Eight Foot Man Child for that. Uh, and then that went away after college. Some years later, uh, I wanted to create my own band aside from the, the uh, street bands that I was in. And uh, I, I just reused the name Eight Foot Man Child for that. And that was a, a very unfocused project. I'm still very proud of everything I did with that. Um, it was kind of a mixture of a lot of Zappa worship. I'm a huge Zappa mark. Um, mixed with medleys of cartoon theme songs and... Uh, Covers of uh, like sci-fi music and a little bit of metal and doom mixed in there as well. So it was uh, all, too many different things. Honestly, it was I was uh, trying to be you know Mr. Bungle and Frank Zappa all at once, and uh, it was unsustainable. Right. Uh, I, I I we did get an album's worth of material recorded, which I never released. <laughs> and but but. The good news is, <laughs> for all you legions of Eight Foot Manchild fans out there, I've since dug back into uh, that that portion that 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 era, and dug up the drum tracks for it, and realized there are four, maybe five songs of that era that would translate well to what Eight Foot Manchild is now. So EP number three, the one coming out after the one we're releasing Friday, is going to have four songs with uh, drum tracks that were recorded over 10 years ago and slightly reworked arrangements of those songs for the style that we're playing now. So that's going to be uh, an interesting challenge. But uh, we've actually finished tracking that whole thing yesterday. I, re I literally recorded the last vocal take yesterday oh, wow. for that. This is great. So look you for EP heard number three first. probably in November or December. That's oh, right. So <laughs> you you've had quite an aggressive recording and release schedule since we first met. Yeah. You have another EP, which I was just grooving to for the first time in a while before we came uh -huh. on. Um, everything sounded great. Everything's looking great. Um, you're. It I seems like that. you've tripled down on your social media presence. <laughs> Which is very different for me. You know, it's not something I've ever, I've, I've for the longest time, and I, I, I'm kind of of two minds about it, because I really, there is a part of me absolutely that's still that guy who wants to say, no, it's all about the music, man. I shouldn't have to be posting on social media, man. That's fake. That's corporate, man. It's all about the music. If you can't get people with the music, then what is it about, man? That's part of me, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm still kind of in that mode. I'm with you. The other there. part of me is, yeah, but the other part of me is like, I'm sorry, it's it's 2023. Consumption habits are different. Like you gotta go where the people are, and you gotta meet them where they're at, and that's just the way it is. You're I didn't actually, make the system, but I'm gonna I'm gonna you know do what I can to make it work for me. You're instrumental in changing my attitude towards social media right because really that's how that's how you and i met that's how you saw something it, you reached out it was totally social media what, what i've had to learn yeah. to do is very carefully cultivate my social media so if 
somebody gets too far to the left or too far to the right, <laughs> I just mute them. I, I don't let go of anybody. I've let go of a couple. But I, I'm proud of my Facebook, both my accounts, like very, very diverse, like from extreme good <laughs> to, oh, my God, batshit crazy. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know um, what you mean. And I've met so many good friends now, so many bands, and it's the lifeblood. I, I know a lot of people think it's harder for a band to break these days. I completely disagree with that. It's just Define more... break, though, right? That's what it comes down to, right? Right. Like, what, do you, what, what are we talking about when we say break? Because it's very different. Breaking today means something very different than it did even 10 years ago. 20 more years than... ago, 30 years ago, forget about it. More than one band in the 70s considered the height of the whole thing when completely bankrupt with a major record deal. Uh, but the one that comes to mind, I don't know if you ever heard of him, but the sensational Alex Harvey band out of no. uh, Great Britain. Um, they have a song called Man in the Jar that you need to absolutely get off here and listen to. Man in the Jar. It's I'm got brass it right at now. the end, the climatic brass that they have. The cornet player is absolutely mind-bogglingly good, um, and it's part of the suite. But uh, there I go again, you know, throwing out my things. But a lot of bands went absolutely bankrupt, didn't make any money, and they'd have to sell fifty to a hundred thousand albums to pay back the advance. The I read the an pay. interview, yeah. Advanced, yeah, 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 the whole the predatory contracts yeah. and all that. I read an interview a few years ago that uh, Iggy Pop is broke. Yeah, Iggy Pop said, "I have no money." Iggy Pop, really? Like so, that's that's so sad, and and I don't even know what to make of something like that. I know, and and it was things like that that prompted. Uh, you might have heard of the guy. I don't know. His name's Robert Fripp. And he formed uh, his he own label. Sounds familiar, yeah. <laughs> formed his own label, uh, Discipline Global. Discipline Global, mobile, yeah. And I remember reading the interview, and this is back before Napster and all that. He's like, I'll sell $100,000 less, 100,000 units less, but I'll make more than that because the revenue right. comes in. Yeah. Yeah, I, that's the kind of... Uh, those are the kind of stories I like to hear. Can I tell you my Robert Fripp story? I by the time died I met dying Fripp? for your Robert Fripp story. <clears throat> so when I was in college, um, he came to play a show there. He was on his solo tour doing his like uh, Frippertronic soundscape type stuff. And I was working as an usher in the performance center at the school. And uh, not knowing the type of person that he was, only knowing that I love his music and that he was a huge inspiration to me, uh, I walked up to him after the show and said, Mr. Fripp, yes, uh, I just want to tell you, you're a huge inspiration to me. I'm a guitarist myself. I've been experimenting with new standard tuning. I think it's really, really cool. Uh, I just really wanted to say that I appreciate all the music that you've made. He said, oh, thank you. I said, can I have your autograph? He said, no. <laughs> and I walked away. And uh been living with that embarrassment ever since <laughs> true but when it comes to the seven degrees of kevin bacon you're right there yeah <laughs> so now i'm one level closer to robert fritt because of that story and that's right mm -hmm. yeah were you surprised by his voice uh no i think i had heard his voice before he has that kind of very thin reedy voice it's so and I erudite was not a good impression and, of him just now yeah Considering the, mm -hmm. the crushing tones that can come out of his guitar. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a good story, dude. Eight Foot mm. Manchild, when I first heard it, it reminded me of Kaiju. Of, you know, somebody like me, perpetually eight years old. I'm going to move. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but that's Ultraman back there. Yeah. I always have I Kaiju Ultraman. or something around me. I love, we are huge Godzilla fans. Yes. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, we made a point to watch every single Godzilla movie 
chronologically from the very beginning up until the present day. I'd never seen all of them. I had seen most of them, but never all at once. So that is where a lot of our uh, inspiration comes from as far as imagery and uh, a lot of the mu movie samples that we use in our, in our music comes from Godzilla films. So I was doing an interview with Brian from Vitzker Sudan about a month ago, a uh, month and a half ago. Special effects on Godzilla. He did, like, I have spoilers on Godzilla for X-Kong. I have inside scoop. Oh. He's working on it. I'm kidding. He didn't tell me anything. But yeah, oh. he works. And he treats it like, yeah, I'm, I'm down there in New Zealand working on the latest Godzilla movie. And I'm like, this is very cool. That's awesome. It is. Yeah. It's a great name for a band. How did you recruit the members? Are they, are they from the same street bands? That you everyone that I know, everyone in this band I've known for years. So they're, they're, we're all from the honk community. We've all played in various different bands together over the years. Uh, some of us still play full-time in honk bands, and others have moved on or are, are still you know, adjacent to it, you could say. Yeah, Can you walk me through the process of figuring out how to electrify the tuba? Uh, well, there's a few ways. Uh, we took a good long time to find what we now think is the best method, right? So we originally started with using an Audix D6 bass drum mic, and we had it on a long bendy arm going down into the bell, which works. It works perfectly well. It picks up a little bit too much extraneous noise. Um, and does have a tendency to feedback, and at least one time, at one gig, it had flipped around <laughs> in, the, uh, in the mic clip and was pointing the exact opposite way, and we were about halfway through a song before we realized. Um, our new method is uh, piezoelectric mics, and I wish I had one here to show you. I'm looking around. Do I have one nearby? I do not. Uh, there's a guy in Australia. His company is called Piezo Barrel. Yeah, if you just look up piezobarrel.com, I believe that's the website, or just Google search it. He makes mics <clears throat> that are uh, piezoelectric. They're about that big, cylinders. And then he gives you a mount that you weld to your mouthpiece or neck piece that you then screw in the microphone at the top and then just plug in an eighth inch to quarter inch adapter. And uh, you can run directly into an amp. You can plug into pedals from there. You can go into a DI box, anything you want. And that's what we have now on all three horns for sax, trombone, and tuba. And it sounds super awesome. They sound really, really clear, really, really articulate, and very, very, very little bleed is coming mm -hmm. from them because they're piezoelectric. You know, they work off of mm -hmm. magic, I assume. I don't know. They, they I, do. I don't know. Microphones to tell you. Yes. I remember 10 years ago, there were a few bases, especially fretless. They were coming out with piezo, and I didn't have the money. I didn't get one of them, but one of my teachers was a, uh, she was sponsored by one of the companies, and I think Lightwave also came up with a really interesting um, pickup that used light in some way. I don't, I don't know how any of this stuff works. It just works. <laughs> is, so is that why um, Shrine of the Orange Sun sounds different? in the the horn and the brass is that one of the that reasons? would definitely be one of the reasons yes because the ep before that would have been rec we recorded the uh saxes and horns with you know conventional condenser and dynamic mics and then all the effects and processing i did was parallel to that so i would copy it to you know a different track and then do all the effects processing on there and mix it in uh, this time we used strictly the piezo mics it, so, it's really articulate. I can hear the separation, especially between the sax and the tuba, where before there was some frequency bleed. Um, I'm mm -hmm. getting some mouthpiece and some reed noise, which is a blessing. Mm -hmm. Thank you for not taking that out because it's down, it's sturdy, it sounds fantastic. <laughs> yeah, the only thing I take out is, because I use a lot of, there's a lot of effects processing happening parallel to the to the dry horns. Mm -hmm. um, like on dis on like if I have a, a sax playing fuzz or anything like that at the same time, I'll take out the breaths because they're just as loud as the notes <laughs> and it gets pretty noisy. So that is the that is one of the things I will edit out. 
What um what fuzz are, are you using? Same fuzz on both, or let's talk. A, let's no. get down and dirty on this. So when you're uh, when you're running saxes and horn, and, you know when you're running horns through effects pedals, you have to be very much aware of extraneous noise that's getting into the signal. And I I also along the entire signal path, I want mm-hmm. to be able to hear the dry horns as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So any effects that we use need to have a clean blend on them. Okay. Right? They can't just be straight up, you know, straight up effects. So on the sax, we've got a Fuzz Rocious 420 fuzz. We're only using it's a it's a dual fuzz, but we're only using the left side because it has a a stronger uh, noise gate on it. And then on the trombone is a uh, Old Blood Noise Endeavors Haunt, which again has the clean blend, has the noise gate. You went boutique. And on, yes. And on tuba, we've got a uh, a Stone Deaf uh, Fig Fum, which is a, a basically a juiced up Big Muff. That's where the name comes from, Fig Fum. Right. But that has a nice noise gate on it as well. And we, that does not have a clean blend on it, but we're running it into an Old Blood Noise Signal Blender, which will then have the dry signal in it. So we should do a rig rundown someday. I can like walk you through every single pedal board. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, you know what? If I get enough comments down below, if we get enough traction on here, oh, screw it. I don't care. We'll do it anyway. <laughs> we'll, we'll do it anyway. Let's do, let's do a rig rundown sometime. It'll be uh, very involved. It will involve a lot of very nerdy tech talk. But, you know, everyone loves that, right? Everyone does, especially on this channel. This channel is for bands. So uh, I kind of like, I don't really like doing reviews um, on this channel. It, it, I mean, you've got uh, The Needle Drop. You've got Sia Trank. There's plenty of guys doing it. Um, I'd right. rather stick to now live reactions. Absolutely. Uh, I'll keep cool. those going still kind of sparingly. So... Mm-hmm. Trying to think, what other effects other than fuzz? So any chorus, flange, like, or do you try so to keep it as simple it, as possible? It's it's a never-ending struggle. Anyone who's super into pedals and effects knows, like, you never keep the same pedal board for more than a couple weeks at a time. You're constantly swapping things out, trying new things, and that's so. Take that and multiply it by four, because we got four pedal boards in this band. <laughs> that's what's going on uh, currently. The horns are all set up with, well, no, sorry. Trombone and sax ba- have basically the same setup. It's, they have, each have a switcher, and we've got a Boss SY200 synth pedal. Okay. So that, that's where they can get their, uh, any kind of like wah-type sounds or spacey, swirly synth sounds come from that. They both have a fuzz. They both have a Boss delay and a reverb. And that's it for the sax and trombone. And then they have switcher, uh, a uh, boss switcher that they can switch out uh, different effects with. Oh, and also an EHX freeze pedal, which is a really awesome pedal that you just hold one note and step on it, and will hold that note indefinitely until you tell it to not do that anymore. Perfect for really bur- awesome. droning, like yeah, yes, familiar with it. I want to. Uh, the plan for <laughs> EP number four <laughs> is to. Uh, I would. I'd love to write a song based around that technology. Something where they. They can hold a note and then play a melody over top and then hold a different note and play a melody over top. I'm, I'm struggling with a way to make that work in a live context, but I, w- I definitely want to try to do that for the next... I'm looking to the way to the future for that. Uh, and then Tuba is roughly the same, almost the same. Uh, she's running into a EHX Hog 2, which is where the extra super low octave comes from, and she can also do like some wah sweep type stuff with that. And uh, then we have the Obni signal blender on one side is the hog on the other side is a, the fig fum and then that's just going into a boss delay and from there into a uh, EQ and then out have oh, you noticed uh, sax and trombone also have their own EQ as well have you noticed any interest essential. from other musicians who hear what y'all are doing and is anybody else reaching out for advice and stuff not yet. I hope so, though. I hope to be at the cutting edge of uh, 
and integrating horns and effects in the context of heavy music. I'd like to be, it would be cool to be the go-to band for advice on that sort of thing. <laughs> uh, you know, like anything, like at a show, people will come up and say, oh, what was that sound? And you point it okay. out to them, you know. But yeah, as far as uh, tutoring people through being able to do it themselves, that hasn't happened yet. I mean, we're still learning ourselves, you know. We're constantly right. experimenting, trying to find the most streamlined way to make this sound happen. It's a huge pain in the ass, you know, four pedal boards all at once. It's a lot of tech, it's a lot of things that can go wrong, and they often do. But if you want this sound, this is how you do it. You got you to gotta put up with that one way or another. So when, we're biting the bullet and we're going with it. When you're, when you're playing live, are you you're relying on monitors or are you using in-ear monitoring? I, uh, monitors are pretty essential, yeah. Yeah, stage monitors, when we can, we got to have stage monitors. At least one, you know, right. preferably more. But no in-ear to... No, no in-ear. Never okay. tried it. Um, I mean, I, if that's something that if we were going to dive into it, I would want to really do it right and get one of the expensive ones. Like super, um, yeah, the $2,000 yeah. with mm. different... If you're going to, that's one of those, yeah, that's one of those things, like, if you're going to do it, I, I'd really want to do it right. I wouldn't want something that's going to crap out us, on us in the middle of a show or sound bad or give us any other kinds of issues. But and also, that's just another layer of tech to have to worry about also. I know. Like, we, we've I got know. so much, we, I am one of those, I'm, I'm one of those people that really likes to just get on stage as quick as possible. And if there was a way to make this band sound the way it sounds by just stepping on stage and plugging in and not having to do anything else, I would do it that way. But, you know. So no digital that, that samples for you? No backing tracks? You're, you're not pulling them out? Only proof? thing, uh, we, do, we do do live samples once in a while for the movie, movie oh, samples yeah, yeah, and yeah, things yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, I don't have a super streamlined way to do that just yet. Uh, that is being worked on though. When we do do that, I have a, uh, I just bring my laptop on stage and I have an app that every key on the keyboard can be a different sound. So, you know, I'll play a Kung Fu sample, a Godzilla sample, stuff like that. But usually that's something I don't bother with because, okay. uh, a lot, you know, again, I just, I really like to try to get on stage and playing as quick as possible. And, you know, on a, a meat and potatoes type gig where it's just, you know, four bands on the bill and everybody's you know you get 15 minutes of changeover you know you don't want to ha add an extra element that's going to have to be taken care of so that's only th something i bust out when it's a situation where i know we'll have plenty of time to set up and sound check and get everything sounding good so if you well, hear this if you come to an eight foot man child show and you and you hear live samples you'll know we're going that extra mile for you <laughs> i was gonna make a joke I, I know of one way that you could make this a lot simpler. Oh, yeah? Ele electric flute, electric clarinet. <laughs> <laughs> we actually have, funny you should mention, I literally live downstairs from uh, the inventor of an electric saxophone. Uh, he's, he owns, he has his own studio upstairs and he made, he, he and a friend designed an electric synth saxophone and our sax player has one, but has never, <laughs> but doesn't want to integrate it into this band <laughs> or we haven't talked enough about it yet anyway. So there's more to but come. Yes, you're absolutely right. There's more to come. Yeah. I, like I said, if I'm ever reincarnated, piccolo. Piccolo. Keep absolutely. Carrying Put a it in your pocket. A yeah. Bass, it. double bass, and then I moved to these six-string monstrosities that <laughs> weigh 12 pounds, <laughs> no. which is why I have Take problems a sitting. Or, hey, I'll, I'll do you one better. Voice. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. A few years I mean, from now, I think I'll just I'll give up on everything. We'll just be a cappella. We're just going to be an a cappella band. We'll get a beatboxer for the drums. And everyone will just sing. You know, that would be no, interesting. No. That would be an interesting concept for y'all to do. Electrify the voice, sound like you're doing, you know, throat singing and stuff. I'm going to send you a, uh, an arrangement that I made many years ago of a Naked City song, an acapella Naked City song. Are you familiar with John Zorn's Naked City? Yeah. 
I did a I did an acapella arrangement of one of his tunes. I'll send you the recording. Ooh, I'll take all the all the stuff I can I can get. <laughs> You're yeah. writing. Um, it seems it always seemed confident. I could never wrap my head around your debut, and you come right out the gate with kind of high concept stuff. What comes first? The does a movie scene inspire you, or are you writing something and you go, "Oh, this would be a perfect movie." How many hours a week do you spend watching old B movies? <laughs> So there's no one, every song has a slightly different path. Um, I will, I have, a, you know, a, a notes app on my phone where any little snippet of anything that I hear that, sa that sounds, oh, that would make a great song title. That would make a great concept. I just write it down. Um, and then I do a lot of my writing in the car. Um, and I have a voice, I use voice memos where I'll just sing little bits of melody or riffs or anything like that into the phone. And then later, I use those to kind of develop into full ideas. It's very rare for me to set aside a specific time where I know ahead of time, I'm going to sit down and purposefully write a song beginning to end. Just sit down with a guitar and some drum tracks and just write it out beginning to end. That has, I can safely say, never happened in all my years of writing music. Not that I'm opposed to the idea. I have toyed with the thought of, like, what if I, what if I packed up my car with some instruments and drove to the woods up in Vermont or something like that for a weekend and wrote, you know, five or six songs? Oh, and just, just kind like of locked the band in blank. there? Kind of a captain. No, part. just me. <laughs> okay. no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to try to organize that with the whole band. Maybe I don't know. Do like a band camp all together and be like, we're just going to go to a cabin somewhere. We're going to write <laughs> five songs together. Uh, that has not. No, maybe. Who knows? God, it's, it's it's like every sentence we do, you seem to come up with another idea. Um, yeah, that, that's that, good I, stuff. I I try to kind of always be in that mode. Yeah. So. Uh, you're doing the guitar on the albums, right? Yes, that's me, believe it or not. It, it's really good. It's the other thing that really stuck out to me, um, and through all the stuff, is the restraint of the guitar. Like, the guitar is there to set the tone, so to speak. It reminds you that you're doomed, but you're really backing off from making the guitar shine and doing your best to give the brass, including the tuba, a little bit to do. Yeah. It's a, it's a juggling act because there are only so many frequencies that the human ear can hear, right? Correct. So you got to kind of carve out enough space for everyone. And it's, it's a challenge. It's tricky. And there's no, there's no rule book for it, as far as I can tell. I don't know if anyone out there knows of, you know, a course that exists in how to mix <laughs> horns and heavy music, send them my way. Because otherwise it's, I'm kind of flying by the seat of my pants out here and You're doing the best the book, I can man. with, with, the, with the skills that I know. Oh, I appreciate You're the that. author <laughs> of this particular thing. I didn't know. I, I had no idea whatsoever when, when I listened to the first, um, your first single that there be no bass guitar that wasn't traditional. And I think it was um, in my second listening, where the first one is with regular speakers, and then I put on headphones. And I just remember uh -huh. that moment where I'm like, I go downstairs to Nubi Doomer and go, oh my God, I think all they have on here is tuba. Because there was no information. <laughs> I couldn't find any information. Yeah. <laughs> Nicely done, sir. Nicely oh, done. Oh, thank you. You've taken the the strategy of doing singles and then combine for more or less combining those singles into EPs. It, right. it, it throws like the doom charts off a bit. Uh, we, we don't generally do the <laughs> single thing. I, I lean into it. Yeah. Um, That's one of the drawbacks of it is, uh, the, yes, a, 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 you know, a conglomerate like the doom charts, they like to see albums. And they're happy if one band does one album every couple of years, right? But we're trying to, we're adopting a strategy that comes from pop music and hip hop. Um, I think 
Spirit Box, maybe the only heavy band I know of that has done something similar to what we're doing, whereby, you know, I'm looking way ahead to the future, right? I'm not just, we don't want to just drop, you know, any old song and then just smash them together into an EP. I, I still want them to have a logical flow to them that when you listen to the EP beginning to end, it, it's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's of a whole. Um, so I, I look to that, I look to the future with that in mind. But the whole concept is, you know, I spent years in bands where the whole, you know, we did the old model, the model that's been around since the early 60s of, mm -hmm. you know, you write a bunch of songs, you drop them all at once on an album, as an album. You release one or two advanced singles, then you drop them all at once, and then you disappear <laughs> until the next one comes out. Mm -hmm. And then you disappear until the next one comes out. And then you disappear to the next... And I did that for a number of years, and it's, it feels like a lot of wasted effort in today's day and age, to be honest, to blow your load all at once. Here we go. Here's 12 songs. Enjoy. See you later. Till the next one. Two years later. Here's another one. Okay, bye. Till the next one. I kind of really like the idea um, of giving, trickling things out a little bit at a time. So that you're mm -hmm. just kind of, you always have something to promote. You always have something to say, hey, here's something new that you haven't heard. Here's something new that you haven't heard. And getting people and just building the catalog cumulatively over time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the concept that we have right now is one song a month. Once we have enough songs for an EP, we drop an EP. And now that we have two EPs out as of this coming Friday, the 14th, we're going to then smash those two together into an album and uh, do oh, vinyl, one to a side. Yeah, we're going to do one EP to a side of vinyl. Are they yeah, going to be has, the That's same? been the long-term goal all along. Are What's they going to be the same mixes, or are you going to give us you know, a little extra incentive to... To go with the LP? Well, I'll definitely have to remaster them, for sure, for, right. for vinyl. Because right now they're, they're mastered to be, you know, that super punchy streaming sound that we like. Uh, when, you're, when you're mastering for vinyl, though, there's a lot of other things you have to take into consideration. You know, the fact that it is a physical media with a physical needle touching a physical groove, and you can't go too loud, you can't go too low, you know. There's a lot of a lot of things you have to take in, into consideration, so we'll definitely do that. There will definitely be some super awesome original artwork, and there you go. Yeah, we'll think of some other goodies to go with it too. Yeah, for sure. With the turnaround that that vinyl has right now, I can't tell you exactly how long that's going to be. Right, all I can say is right now we're we're talking to artists to do some original art for us. That's and, awesome. Uh, once that's sorted out, we're gonna we're gonna send it away to get printed. It's still strange to me the vinyl is still a thing. Yeah, it's pretty bizarre. But I've been... Uh, and when I get labels on, I try to pitch this. How about just sell us the album cover? Just the cardboard, maybe the gatefold <laughs> or something in it? And and I can download it onto my hard drive? Because I do miss the art. I miss the lyrics and the liners that's, and all that. So... All you folks out there in TV land, I love you, but you need to be honest with yourselves. Vinyl does not sound better than streaming. What you, the thing that you like about it, and the thing that I like about it, is the artwork, and the fact that it's fun to collect, and the whole tactile experience of taking it out of the cover and smelling the cardboard and, and putting it on the record and placing the needle on the record. And it's, it forces you to be an active listener, an active participant in the listening, yeah. right? That's what it's all, uh, vinyl is all about that tactile experience of kind of a personal connection to the music on this physical object. And I totally, and guess what? That's enough for me. I don't, I don't need to hear about how, no, you need this type of needle with this type of cartridge and you need to get this $9,000 pair of speakers, otherwise you're not listening to real music. Like, <laughs> you can miss me with all that shit. Like, well, if that's good for you, you at, go for it. But <clears throat> I'd love to see you in a one-on-one -on -one debate with Michael Fremer from 
uh, used to be with audio file. Mag- I used to read stereo file. I used to read all that stuff. Uh-huh. I couldn't wait for vinyl to disappear. And, and there were two reasons. <laughs> Tchaikovsky's 1812 Overture, right? We had uh, okay. a very coveted, you know, nowadays techniques turntable. We had old Wharfdale speakers. We have everything. The cannons come on, and all of a sudden, the whole the whole arm just jumps like right off the album because it couldn't handle the it's back with right. the uh half speed yeah. masters yeah and all of a sudden the needle jumps oh. off. and then listening to something like mike oldfield which is you know he gets these really intense quiet passages and i hear <laughs> i'm like eh. so but CD that's comes but out. that's that's part of the fun, man. No, you, no, those no, those no. crackles and pops. If I want that, I'll eat character. Rice Krispies. I don't. <laughs> so, so CD comes. I was in the Navy, and I spent probably three hundred bucks on a horrifyingly bad CD player, uh, because back then <sighs> they didn't have the filters figured out, and you had some. They weren't really mastering for CD. They were taking the RIAA masters for vinyl. Putting it, it did mm-hmm. not translate well, but I still remember to this day. Um, Paul Simon's Graceland was the first, and and I bought you two. Joshua Tree was second. I was in heaven <laughs> because, and then with the old lasers, they'd start to skip if you got a little thing on it. Of course, yeah. So I, I'm in love with the streaming. Yeah. So EP's dropping. You've got an, another EP. Um, coming out probably how, November or December. Haven't decided yet. How how are the gigs going? How often are you getting out there? We're trying to get out once a month. That's the goal. Trying to do at least once a month. Uh, more than that can sometimes be a strain depending on how far away it is or the nature of the gig. But once a month is the goal. Yeah. And then you also have a YouTube channel, right? We do, and I wish I kept up with it more often. It's been, I mean, it's a very old channel. I've had it mm-hmm. since 2006 or something like that. It's been my channel. And I've, it's gone through many different phases of, of, of ideas. Right now, it's a dumping ground for weird meme type videos and occasional music. So I haven't quite figured out, you know, I got, I have over a thousand subscribers, but I got all of those through right. doing things like, uh, like the, uh, I don't know if you saw my, uh, my, my Lord of the Rings supercut. I did. Or uh, I, where uh, where every scene had, where there's more than two <laughs> two women, right? Yes, yes. Good stuff. And uh, you know that's where all my subscribers come from. But how do you then translate that to? Hey, I also have this band that you might want to check out. It's like, it's it's a very dumb strategy for building an audience. So I haven't quite figured out what I'm going to do with that yet. I might YouTube just is cut hard. out. All, yeah, YouTube it's hard is. and it's kind of exhaust. It's a little bit exhausting mentally to like think about like video editing and and you know even just coming up with concepts for videos is is, is tricky for me because i don't have any specific theme other than music and then silly shit so <laughs> well, this, I, the silly I haven't shit quite really figured works. it out okay my friend that. i'm about to turn into a pumpkin on a sunday afternoon which by the way this is like going to a mad day when i'm a kid where i go to go see like star wars the movie is over and it's still light outside. It's really weird. I kind of like it. Is there anything mm-hmm. I haven't asked you about yet that you were just dying to tell us? <laughs> uh, I think you did a wonderful job. You've provided uh, us mm-hmm. with a, a great opportunity to uh, get ourselves out there. And this is the first video interview any of us have done in the band. No way. Um, you're so yeah, good at this. Absolutely. Oh, I appreciate that very much. Uh, I like to think, you know, this is the start of something real big. We're going to jump off and, and take over the world with our doom brass sound. Yeah, if anyone wants think... a free sticker, uh, hit, hit us up on Bandcamp or any of our social media. We'll send you a free sticker. Uh, if you've ever seen the movie Scanners, that might look familiar to you. <laughs> and... Uh, if you've never seen the movie Scanners, um, we invented this. This is totally original artwork. We didn't take it from anywhere. <laughs> I love that movie. Um, <laughs> so what other merch? Do you have any other merch? Do you have any patches? We've got T-shirts with the same design if you want them. Okay. 
yeah, we got some handmade uh, patches. And yeah, keep an eye out for the vinyl. If you're a vinyl type person, we'll have vinyl. Ooh, hopefully, yeah, hopefully by the end of the year. We'll see. I am. We, what with the turnaround that things are nowadays, we can't make any promises. But keep keep an eye on our social media for that type of stuff. I am assembling my first ever battle vest. Uh, oh boy! Hard, I heard to believe after fifty when, years. When we, or as something. soon as we get off. As soon as we get off, I want you to send me your email address and your unisex T-shirt size, my friend, and we'll send you Absolutely, a care package. Absolutely, it'll happen. Dylan, I, I really wish you all... I don't think you need luck. I'm not wishing you luck. I think <laughs> oh, well, I appreciate everything that. you're doing, you're, you're hitting all the right beats. You've picked up the pace on a lot of things. I agree with you totally about your strategy of how to release. Doom Charts, we are... You know, we'll do... Um, we definitely do EPs now. The singles. I think one thing the bands forget is I think we probably had, I'm going to guess, at around 600 or more submissions last month Oof. alone. And yeah. of those, like it was close to 400 actually got a vote. And and so, you know, I I wake up in the morning and I'll have 15 more submissions and then bands reaching out. And mm. we get overwhelmed, so we do need more bloggers. We do need more writers. Um, I'm not whining. It's just it's very competitive. I think you have an edge in that you, you've, you've picked the right niche. You've picked the unserved niche. Um, <laughs> I think it's going to grow. And, and I like for to me, think so. Yeah. For me, it's about getting not only clean and sober a little bit outside of just the Stoner Dune thing, but also the bands. I think there is a very large um, high school, college. I mean, the college audience seems like baked in, man. Like, you know, I tell you what, the day that, that we're on TV and we see Michigan or Ohio State pull off an eight-foot man-child, then you have arrived. Funny you should mention one of the I, tunes I wrote for a brass band that I used to be in it's played by the uh, Indiana, I forget what they're called, the, some, the, the Amazing 100 or something like that. One of the Indiana State uh, bands plays a song that I wrote <laughs> for, a, a pre, for a marching band that I used to play in. Oh, you've got if a, I can find a video, it. If I can find a video, I'll send it to you. But yeah, that's a, that's a good, I haven't even thought of that. That's a foot in the door. Maybe I'll send you've them another song. You've got a foot in the door, man. You're just this <laughs> far away. Dude, I have been looking forward to that. I'm sorry it took so long for us to be able to get together. No but, problem. We appreciate um, I, any any amount of time is is good for us. We're 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 fl we're super flattered to get any kind of attention whatsoever <laughs> out here in these streets. You guys are eight foot tall and you act like children. It's hard to ignore oh. you. <laughs>